co-chair um, H.S. Sabres, along with, um, with Doug Davis. And um, I'd like to begin by, uh, in, the, in the manner of friends, by uh, observing a moment of silence. Thank you, everyone. Um, we have a full agenda, and we are thrilled to have. Oh, okay. Um, we have a full agenda. Yeah. Okay. I would love to start by introducing Anya Lavides, who's going to speak to you about the Parent um, Ambassador Network for Admissions. I just want to take two seconds of your time to have a captive audience. I'm on. Yeah. For those of you who I don't know. We, if you don't know, we have a group at Friends Central called the Parent Ambassador Network, which is basically a group of parents who work with the admission office to do outreach to prospective families, to, to the parents of prospective students. Um, and we kind of make phone calls or emails sort of as the students are going through the admissions process. Um, the more current parents we have involved, the better matches we can make with these families in terms of common interest or common neighborhood or you know, professional connection or whatever. So for any of you, many of you have already been involved. For many of you, um, this is new, and even if you're new to the school, you're a great asset. Whether you, you know, you may not have years of history here, but you may have a connection at the school that your child came from. So, if you're interested in getting involved, please let me know. I'll be here, you know, afterwards, or there's been emails with my email address. Feel free to just reach out and let me know that you'd like to be involved. Um, the bulk of the sort of phone calls and stuff will take place January, February, March, when students start hearing from the school or being more sort of seriously in the admissions process. So just let me know, we'd love to have you. Everybody is welcome to participate. <laughs> and um, as I said, the more people we have, the better we can match people up. So thank you. Thanks. <laughs> so thank you for your patience. Um, Dan was helping me get the network working. And I'm going to do this here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. so that no one could argue that we had taken him to the other side of the family. <laughs> We're learning the politics of having a young child. Um, so obviously Anya told you a little bit about Pan. Um, on the agenda this morning, I wanted to tell you what's new in a variety of areas in middle school and what we're up to, um, some ongoing projects of mine, and then we'll do questions. Now, Originally, I had planned to talk about iPads toward the end, but I know that um, some seventh grade parents in particular thought that today was going to be devoted specifically to iPad feedback, which was not actually how I had planned this morning. So in order to not disappoint or confuse everyone, I moved the iPad stuff to the beginning. Um, and then we'll do a, a about 10 minutes of iPad-specific questions, and then I'll move on to all of the other things that I wanted to talk to you about because there are many, many exciting things going on. So, so, in the what's new category, obviously iPads fall into that category. I want to tell you about some student opportunities that are new this year, some spaces that are making for some interesting programming, uh, what we're doing for meeting for worship this year, that's a little different from last year, uh, an exciting parent education opportunity, we are now in grades 6 through 12 departments, so I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that. And then a feedback and growth task force, which I will describe a little later. So iPads. So um, about two weeks ago, the tech department sent your children a survey, uh, and about uh, 100 of 168 students have filled it out thus far, and they can, which is actually very good if you do surveys. You know that's a good <laughs> response rate. Um, and we will have uh, opportunities for them to keep giving feedback. The link to that survey is still live, so if they haven't done it, we keep reminding them and giving them time and advisory to complete it. But the basic feedback that we've received is students are feeling organized and fairly confident with their uses of the iPad. There are tons of thumbs up, particularly for notability, the ability to write on a document, a PDF, and uh, especially for math, that's been very, very helpful. We didn't have that capacity with the Chromebooks, for example, last year, and that was a major issue. Uh, the kids are finding the projects and assignments interesting. There's a variety of apps being used, so we asked them to identify the different apps they're using and that they like, and there was a lot of variety in that. They 
they're liking Google Drive for producing and storing their work, and they all said that the tech support has been really wonderful. Vicki Schwobel, who works in our library, is the instructional coordinator <coughs> for middle school, and she's been coming to every single assembly and doing tech support and tips, and so I think students are feeling like they can also go to her anytime. So she is a really, really wonderful asset. She's going to be here, but she's actually out today. So that's, those are some general themes in the feedback. So feedback in terms of issues or difficulties that students are having. Um, they told, they identified a bunch of places where the network signal needs boosting, where they're having difficulties. So the tech department is on that right away. Uh, printing. And I'll talk about how we're handling these after I get through them. So um, there's a perceived lack of choice versus paper versus iPad, sorry, paper versus iPad, distraction. Uh, the haiku calendar is a source of frustration for students and I see parents nodding in recognition. I'll talk about parent feedback as well. Finding assignments, so getting from where the assignment is in haiku to wherever the actual assignment sheet or um, worksheet is and then the timing of assignments being posted. So on Monday, we had an in-service day for teachers, and we actually spent half of our time as middle school faculty thinking about these very issues. So I just want you to know that we are still receiving feedback, but we're already addressing these things. So I'll tell you about each one. So printing. So as a middle school faculty, we are not going to require any assignments to absolutely have to be printed. So if there's a poster, obviously that's a little bit different. But if students are handing in something that was produced on the iPad, we're not requiring them to print it because it's just too difficult either at home or here. And so we're having them submit electronically. If they want to submit it in a printed version, that's great. So we're trying to eliminate that issue, and I think we have. Um, I think teachers have not, uh, students feel like maybe there's, that they have to use the iPad for certain things. And teachers said, oh really? We, we didn't think we ever said that they had to do that, but that was a perception of students. So now as teachers, we're being a little bit more clear about you don't have to use the iPad for this, here's where you have some choice. So we're actually articulating that to students so that if they like to use paper for whatever it might be, note taking, that they have that, uh, they know that that is available to them. Distraction. Um, so we uh, threw out a ton of great ideas. We actually, as teachers, just said, okay, what's working, what's not working, how can we help each other, how can we help students related to distraction? Um, and let's be honest, distraction was an issue before iPads, and it would be an issue without iPads. Um, it's a little bit different with iPads, for sure. Um, so we came up with some really great ideas, and some of it is balancing teachers not wanting to spend all of their energy in the class policing the iPads, and acknowledging that there is a significant classroom management component. So we're trying to strike a balance between monitoring, but also not getting off track with the actual learning. Um, teachers have come up with some great ideas, and I'll just give you one. So there was an observation from one teacher that students really like to draw on the iPad, and so that is a potential distraction, the drawing apps. And so this teacher has started at the beginning of class, giving three minutes where the students use a drawing app to illustrate a concept from the day before. So for example, if you're conjugating uh, verbs in Spanish and you want to make sure that you understand what means that they're actually drawing out the different verb conjugations and vocabulary. And that's just at the beginning of class, but it's acknowledging that they like to draw, so it's incorporating it into the lesson. That just is just one example of how we're handling potential distractions. Um, the haiku calendar. I don't have a great solution because I, I don't, I can't change haiku. But what we are doing is in the next week, Diane Foreman and Vicki Schwobel, Diane Foreman is our middle school learning specialist, are going to work with every grade to help look at the calendar and try to navigate it a bit, a bit better. So we're doing really specific direct instruction related to the calendar, how do you manage this, how do you get the assignment view into your brain about what does this mean for my actual week. So we're actually giving them 
an actual printed calendar that they could use. We're looking at Google Calendar, a lot of different options, and helping them to see how does what's in the Haiku calendar end up translating into what you're doing with your homework. So I'm excited, and we'll use Diane and Vicki's work with the students to figure out how we need to move forward with training related to the calendar. Finding assignments. Um, so teachers are trying to make sure that they link assignments in Haiku to whatever the assignment is. Here's the tricky part of that. I hope you can, I'm hoping you can follow me on this. So when we hand out, if I handed out an uh, electronic worksheet to all of you, I can't link to your individual worksheets. There's no way to do that. And so the link is to Google Drive, which for some students is still an extra step. So we're trying to figure out how do we get around that. And a lot of these things we're trying to figure out good workarounds that work for our kids. The truth about a learning management system like Haiku, and there are many out there, I, I see lots of university folks in the audience, a Blackboard, Moodle, Canvas, there are many, many systems. None of them are perfect. And all of them have things that don't work exactly the way that you want them to for your given purpose. So we're really working to figure out what do we need to do for our middle school students and what are the right workarounds. Um, and honestly, we had some of these same issues with Veracroft, so I think we know that there's no perfect solution. Timing of assignments being posted. So this is exciting news. So on Monday, we decided as a faculty, originally we had said that we would post all assignments by 5 or 5.30, which for many students is just too late because they're coming home at 3.30 and wanting to check and then they feel like they have to keep checking. So all assignments will be posted by 3.15. Most will be posted by 1.30. So at the beginning of advisory, we're actually telling students that the first five minutes of advisory, teachers are going to be putting in the assignments. And so students aren't going to be able to sign out for those first five minutes to allow teachers to get the assignments posted. Um, and sometimes they'll be posted way ahead of that. But if I have a class that's at 1240 to 120 and we only get to a certain amount, if I put the assignment in that morning or the day before, it's no longer going to be correct. So we need a little bit of time there to make sure that the assignments are in. Um, but everything will be in by 3.15, and if they're not, the student is not responsible for it. So I feel really excited about that. We told students about that on Tuesday, um, and so they know that that's the new format from the beginning of Extra Help, that that's what teachers will be doing. Um, any questions about that specifically? And I will offer some iPad specific questions. So I actually just went through those. So um, anecdotally, these are coming to me through emails and parent conversations, I would say that the biggest challenges reported by parents include concerns about distraction, helping students, your children, to track their assignments, seeing what's being produced, so it's not the same as having a binder in front of you where you can look through and see all of the work, and then monitoring iPad usage at home. That includes the cumulative amount of screen time in a day. So um, this week, actually tomorrow probably, you are going to receive a parent survey, similar to the ones that students received. And I'm asking that you fill it out and either add to or elaborate on things that you are facing as parents so that then we can gather all of that feedback, not just the feedback I've heard so far, so that we can then address some of those issues. But um, in the meantime, I just want to also mention that next Tuesday night at 7 p.m. is Tech Tuesday. And I know I can see some people who attended the first Tech Tuesday and we did some really great troubleshooting um, and also help for parents about how to navigate the different components of the iPad program. So uh, there will be opportunities for parent feedback. It just so happens that one of them is next week, which is very convenient for us, and then the parent survey coming out tomorrow or perhaps Friday. Um, so that survey link will be live. You don't have to fill it out the first day you get it, and we will really, really appreciate your feedback on these things and anything else that you're experiencing so that we can stay in ongoing communication and address any challenges. Um, I just want to say too that I, I hope you feel that there's an ongoing feedback loop and, and connection for communication. You can always uh, 
talk to teachers or email them if there's something specific that your child or you are confused about in a given class they're the right person to go to. If you come to me and say something's not working right with the math assignment, I'm going to go to the teacher because I can't answer for him or her. Um, or if there's a sort of bigger systemic concern that you have, then I encourage you to meet with me um, or we can talk on the phone if that's easier for your schedule. But that's really, really important for us to stay in communication and then also for these formal opportunities for feedback that you feel like you have that opportunity. So we were going to send the uh, survey out before Thanksgiving, but we then realized that parents were probably dealing with a lot about traveling, so we waited for after. So that's the time difference between student and parent survey, in case you're wondering why we asked your children. <laughs> um, so uh, how about if, since we're on the iPad topic, I'll offer some time right now before we get to a bunch of other things for iPad specific questions. Um, actually, I had a question going back to the time timing of homework assignments. Yes. Does that also include posting, for instance, like a high uh, Alex quiz? Um, so if that's part of their homework, will that be linked up at that time? It sh yes. Yeah. Or because if they're, I mean, sometimes they use that as a study guide. Right. So it's great to say they're not responsible for it, but it's part of their. Right. Study so guide. the 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 link to doing that quiz would be posted by three. Are the teachers also verbally telling them what their assignments oh, are? Oh, this is a great question. Thank you, Susie. So the question, in case you couldn't hear, was are teachers also verbally telling the students what the assignments are? And the answer is yes, and it's written on the board in every room. Okay. So they are written, most of the boards on the right, if I'm thinking about the observations I've done, um, they're written on the board, and then the teacher explains it verbally in class. Yes. Um, one thing I found is that when my kids turn something in, then I say to them, how did you do on that assignment? And then they never go back and look at the feedback. That, thank you. That was one thing we talked about as teachers the other day, too, is we talked about devoting class time to make sure that students are looking back at the feedback. Right, like they never go back to it. Once right, and then more done. often incorporating an assignment that would be, okay, use that feedback to do yeah. X, okay. make corrections, elaborate, expand, whatever it might be. For, so that was, thank you for reminding me, that was also something are there teachers that are doing the haiku assignment well that other teachers could model? Yes, and actually, um, in particular, we so we do something in faculty meeting that we call 10-minute teacher. So we have teachers do mini lessons or talk about how they're using technology or different methods of teaching in their classrooms. And the most recent one was actually Padraig Berry talking about how he's using haiku in some really interesting ways. So yes, and that was exactly what he talked about, was how um, he's putting the assignments on there, how they're using notability. So if you have sixth graders, you know that they were doing mitosis recently, using notability to draw out their onion lab and do some really interesting things. So yes, great question. Um, Jake was mentioning he did uh, iPads or not, and I don't like to use iPads very much in Yes. Which, which I support. Yes. Uh, but he said what he used to be able to do is have some of his homework and his math problems, problems etc. So I was wondering if there's something like, you know, in a room where there's a teacher in a room where kids can go during those periods to work, to do work. Yes. And if that's enough like. Right. So the question, in case you couldn't hear it, was um, we actually do not allow students to use the iPads during recess and lunch. We'll also athletics, obviously, because they're doing different things. But um, the purpose of that was to take a break from the screen for social interaction. Now the challenge is if a student wants to complete work during that time or show a stu another student what they've been working on, if they're collaborating on a project, there is a little bit of a challenge there. We've had some students say, well, why can't I be working on work then? So we're, we're navigating that. But um, we really try to discourage them because we think it's important to go out and play. We think it's important to get a snack, take a break. So it's a balance for sure, and we're, we're still figuring it out. Yeah. What's the best way to um, track if an assignment's been submitted? Because mm -hmm. like, electronically, it's very hard for us to know if something's been there, if something's mm -hmm. been submitted, mm -hmm. and to see how they did on it. Yeah, so. I think the best way is to, 
you all have access to Google Drive, so that's one way to do it, is to go into science and see the assignment. One would be to have your child show you the assignment. And then in Haiku, there, there should be a so way. Let me see if I can get tech to make a little video that we could send out that would okay. show you how to do that. Yeah. Vicky, do you see the videos that Vicky posts? Have people been watching them? They're really great. Okay, and just the facts this week, I'll put another link to the parent site because she does these great little instructional videos that have screenshots and show you how to do things step by step. So I will ask her to do that. Lydia, can you remind me at the end to ask her? Thank you. Yes. Hi. Um, I wonder if there's a way, as you mentioned earlier, I think we all would agree that there's no one system that does everything you want it to do. Mm -hmm. But right now it seems like we're using three or four or more systems and everybody who's using them is using them differently. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if we could just go back to something much simpler and pick one so that you don't have to navigate back and forth among the school website, Haiku, Veracross, Google Docs, and get lost somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. Especially for those of us who are not really tech savvy. Yeah, so, so the challenge with that is, um, so let's just take the example of Veracross. Um, if we're exclusively in Veracross, we still have to have Google Docs, right? Because you can't produce work in Google in Veracross, rather. It's just a, a management system in terms of assignments. Um, so we still would have to have Google Docs. And then there are other capabilities of something like Haiku. The whole reason we're using Haiku is it allows teachers to build the class web pages where all of the content would be. So if we were to go to just Veracross, we wouldn't have that capability. And so I, I absolutely hear what you're saying. We actually tried to streamline this year by just using Haiku. You'll remember last year we were doing Haiku and Veracross, and that was a real source of, um, of concern and frustration for parents and kids, so we actually streamlined. Um, but we still have the same issue, which is that if you're talking about students producing work, they can't produce work in Haiku. So this is the kind of conundrum. There isn't a great solution. What we're trying to do is figure out and keep, figure out what we have now, trying to make it user friendly for students. And I think we'll keep working. So I met with four, four friends, school, middle school principals a week or two ago, and we all talked about all the different systems we're using. Everyone is using a different system, and we're all having the same difficulty in that in that area exactly. So um, it's not it's not just our issue. And the good news is that I think we've streamlined a bit, and we'll continue to work on how we can make it fewer fewer things to navigate. But I mean, the all of us probably experience that in our work lives, we're navigating a lot of different things too. What you can do in Google Docs is very different from what you can do in Excel um, or Google Spreadsheets versus Excel. So some of it is the reality that we're all using a lot of tools because we want to be productive and use the tool that's best for whatever purpose. So, but I, I really understand what you're saying. We are thinking about how to do it better and we're also looking at different options. Just to follow up quickly yeah. on that, is there a way that, uh, maybe I've missed this, maybe it's already out, is there a way that you can have like a, a key, a yes, key page actually. where you have, if you're looking at this and you need to get to this, yes, how to do it? Yes, actually we have that key, and it's called the technology cheat sheet for parents, and I will, um, we handed it out at um, curriculum night, um, and I will be happy to send it out again in yeah, sure. It's also on that parent one-to-one -one website that I talked about. There's one for students and one for parents. So how students should navigate the different um, portals and also how parents can. Especially for my son, but it's difficult on the iPad to have any type of a spell check or a yes. thing. Is there any way of incorporating something that would give these kids a little highlight for the For spelling? Yes, I mean, so Google Docs. That's partly why we want them to use Google Docs is that it does it does do spell check and help them see. Not on the iPad. No. no. Let me ask Mickey about that. One yeah, of the they don't get any highlighted. The language yeah. arts teacher recommended to me for the Perfect spell is to type it in on the computer. 
the U of O docs, and then it will oh. mm -hmm. do the spell check and then cut and paste yeah. it back into the yeah. Yeah. It, it does. It does. does. It does. Like it's interesting in the all student all survey, and I, I think in the general vicinity of the statistic here, but um, the students reported that 75% that they 75% of them said that they use a computer and the iPad. So a lot of them are going back and forth for different purposes or because they want to use a computer. I mean, there's lots of different reasons, but that's a, that's a great point. How is your experience in middle school informing the upper school and vice versa? Okay, great question. So the question was, um, how is our experience in middle school informing the upper school and vice versa? Um, in upper school, they are just using their across, but also upper school students are navigating those same number of things. So they're using Notability, they're using Google Docs, they're using different apps and programs. So um, we're all thinking about how could we streamline, or perhaps in upper school, I think there's an understanding that students who are a little bit older can navigate those things a bit easier. So there's a interesting question of, well, perhaps middle school students need something a little bit different, but we want them to be ready for that transition. So that's something that we're thinking about. Um, we, we have talked about, we've told upper school teachers how we're using Haiku so that they can get a sense of it. We have um, been asking them, this is getting to the departments, asking them how they're using the different apps um, in their departments so that we can start doing it in middle school. So for example, um, they're, oh, Shannon. There's a great app called Subtext that allows you to annotate, which I, I think is fantastic. You can see what other people have annotated. And so we are using that app in both middle school language arts and upper school English because we feel like that's an annotation app that could work across divisions. So that's an example of something informing, um, informing having more coordination so that students get used to an app that we anticipate them continuing to use. I, I'm mindful of the time, so I want to move on to some other things. There will be time at the end, and I'll be happy to answer more questions. Oh, I did want to mention, too, that um, Common Sense Media, if you are not familiar with it, is a fantastic website. It has a whole section about parent concerns related to technology. I think their resources are excellent. We are using the Common Sense Media curriculum for um, digital or cyber safety and digital citizenship. So that you can also check out what we're using. Um, they have uh, reviews of apps. They have reviews of different content, not just computer content, but movies, television shows, all sorts of stuff. It's, it's really great. And you can also explore by age. So if you have children of different ages, if you have a, a seven-year-old, you could check it out for him or her. You can also do it for middle school, obviously. So I really highly recommend checking out Common Sense Media. It also talks to you about how to set parental controls. It's great. It's a wonderful piece. Okay, so getting back to some of the things that are new. I wanted to tell you about a few um, student opportunities that are new. We have seven new clubs and service projects, which is exciting. And on the new Friend Central website, there are now descriptions of each service project and club, which we've never had on the Friend Central website. So you can check that out in the middle school section. One of the ones we're particularly excited about is Lego Robotics, which is being led by Nikki Sims, who's our new seventh grade science teacher. Um, they're currently constructing an arena for their, for their robots, so I'm excited to see how that turns out. Um, we have started something, uh, we've been calling it various things, conversation corner, uh, alliterative, things like that. But on Wednesdays, which is um, right after service, we're having conversations about current events, and you may have read about this in the parent newsletter. This stemmed actually from a conversation over the summer of teachers, how are we gonna teach and talk about Ferguson? And so what we decided was that we wanted to have an opportunity for students to talk about current events in an informal but moderated forum. And so what we do on Wednesdays is there's a table in the back of the lunchroom, so they don't have to go anywhere special, they just grab their lunch, come over. And we've had some really, really interesting conversations. 
the last one that I uh, attended, we were talking about domestic violence and the NFL. So they're all topics that are relevant, that kids are hearing about, and it's a great opportunity. The teachers just sit there mostly, and it's really driven by students. Um, it's been fantastic, and what's really interesting is that some upper school students have started joining us because they're so intrigued by it. So we've loved that, and it's really nice to have our old middle school students come back and sit with us during those conversations. I'm just curious how many kids are participating. Um, I would say on average about 10, 8 to 10. It's different, and there's probably three or four teachers. There's a lot of teachers who have found it really interesting. So, um, Does somebody initiate the conversation? So the students know that they can suggest a topic, and then um, Ann Keneally actually posts the topic for, the, for that Wednesday on the bulletin board so that students can see, oh yeah, that topic really interests me, or oh, you know, I think I'll go next week. Um, so yes, and then a, a teacher says, okay, today we're talking about, might give a few key facts or terms, and then, and then we kind of get out of the way. So um, that's been really, really interesting. Um, and I anticipate that this week will probably be going back to Ferguson given um, the lack of an indictment that was announced last week. So, um, finally, uh, last year we started a student council and we, over the course of the year, started to think about how to tweak it to make it make the most sense for our middle school. And so what we did uh, was we decided that we did not want members to be elected in middle school. Um, instead, we thought that it was a really great opportunity to teach students about Quaker process and building consensus. And so starting at the beginning of this year, advisors worked in their advisories to, as an advisory, by consensus, determine two student reps from that advisory who would serve on the Student Leadership Council. Um, and uh, yesterday, they were actually, their topic was, how could we, um, what are, what are things that we like or don't like? What are things that we as students could change about the dining experience here at Friends Central? Fascinating conversation. <laughs> <laughs> was the first thing the lock? <laughs> no, but it probably would have been okay. had they known about it. <laughs> but they, I mean, really, really interesting things. Everything from just the challenge of finding a lunch table and what that feels like as a middle school student to saying, gosh, we'd love to have more art in the dining hall. The art gallery's right there, but you can't see any of it. I, mean, I never thought about that. And someone said, um, well, it would be so great if we stopped wasting paper on the menus and maybe had a screen at the front of the lunch line so we wouldn't be printing paper menus every day. I mean, brilliant. Your children are brilliant. Um, but that's the kind of conversation that's happening in Student Leadership Council with the expectation that that group will bring those ideas and concerns both back to their advisories and also to teachers. So it's very exciting. Uh, room 10. So if you haven't been in room 10 yet, over the summer it got a major facelift and also a lot of new furniture. Uh, this is actually the Student Leadership Council picture from yesterday that I took, so that's very current. So uh, room 10 is now a flexible classroom. Instead of having desks, we have these big tables, chairs on wheels, and a ton of different configurations. We have four collaboration stations in the different corners, which consist of a monitor and a table. And at that monitor, there's a computer, and they can also project their iPad onto the monitor. So if you're working in a group and you want to say, okay, here's my idea, you can put it right up there and as a group work on it. So we're, uh, we're they're doing a lot of really exciting things in this room as teachers. Um, and this was really designed with the one-to-one -one program in mind, um, but it's also a meeting and gathering space, and room 10 was just not as flexible and user-friendly for that as it, uh, it, it wasn't that way in the past. And now we're finding that a lot of groups and classes want to use room 10 in interesting ways. Um, the derivative fair will be here next week. Uh, during diversity day, we set up a pop-up iPad exhibit where students had pictures of their families and we set it up like a museum and moved around um, and saw pictures of each other's families. It was really quite moving, actually. Uh, we also have the maker space in the FCC. 
And just to give you an idea of some current things it's being used for, the eighth grade science students are doing Rube Goldberg projects, and they're actually entering them in a contest in January, which we're excited about. There was a rumor going around that maybe one of them should end in like a bucket of confetti being dropped on Craig Sellers. <laughs> that might just be a rumor. Um, the sixth grade is using the makerspace for their derivative projects, and so uh, that's an exciting new addition to the derivative project, which has been a wonderful project for many years. We have Make Club happening in there and Robotics Club. So the makerspace has a clean side and a dirty side, so there's a lot of different things you can do. Shannon, you look like you I wanted to raise your hand. The, the rotation classes. Yes, and the rotation classes, so computer science classes are using the makerspace as well. So um, there's exciting stuff to come. Meeting for worship. So I talked a little bit about this last year, but we continue to face the challenge of the fact that middle school students feel somewhat reluctant to stand up and meeting for worship. And if you think back to yourself as a middle school student, you know why. Um, and so we continue to experiment with different ways to make it both meaningful and less overwhelming or nerve wracking for students smaller groups, different locations. We're doing some pre-meeting activities, like a prompt that allows students to think about something before going to meeting. We are trying to really spread the idea that you can share without speaking. So you're participating in the silence, you don't have to speak. Um, and then also doing some you know, activities in meeting for worship that involve participation without speaking. So for Thanksgiving, we wrote what we were thankful for, and then we created a chain of gratitude out of paper that hung in the, in the dining hall, actually. And um, doing worship sharing groups. So this is a brand new idea from the Religious Life Committee. We're uh, toying with the idea of creating worship sharing groups that would stay the same through middle school. So if you're a sixth grader, you would be paired with seventh and eighth graders, and then that group would kind of travel together. And yes, eighth graders would move on and you'd get new fifth graders, but you'd have a core group of students who stayed the same. The idea being that if you're with a core group repeatedly, there might be greater comfort without speaking or sharing. So that's, that's a new idea. Um, some of you have asked for this, and I'm really excited to report that Al Bernacchio, is going to um, be leading a parent gathering in January or February. We're trying to identify a date right now and then a snow date, just in case, <laughs> um, about helping your teen or tween develop healthy sexuality. So many of you know that Al is a teacher in our upper school. He's an English teacher and human sexuality teacher. He had a book come out in September. Uh, he was actually on Voices in the Family on WHYY on Monday, which is great if you want to hear the podcast. It's posted on their website. Um, and he's going to talk about healthy sexuality and relationships. Uh, so I really hope that you'll join us for that evening. He's done it for eighth grade parents in the past, and I asked him to do it for all middle school parents, and he'll talk about how it's different if you're a sixth grade parent versus seventh versus eighth, but I think that that will be really, really wonderful. So stay tuned for information about that. But uh, I also have asked him to talk with the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders separately by grade, and he is going to introduce some of those same ideas with the students. So that is exciting. That will probably happen in January. Again, identifying dates. And finally, um, Al, Lisa Manshor, who teaches health, Patty Zaradik, who teaches eighth grade science, and I are meeting to talk about the sexuality and healthy sexuality curriculum across the grades. So we're trying to coordinate what language do we use and how can we make sure that students are getting consistent messages and how do we perhaps steer away from things that um, aren't as engaging or relevant for students and that are actually what they're thinking about and wondering about. So I'm excited to be doing that work with them. Interestingly, I also had two upper school students who are my former students who came and said, we'd really like to give you some feedback about health curriculum and the science sex ed curriculum, so they were actually a part of the meeting too, which is really, really great. Um, so we are now, um, we now have departments that are grades six through 12. So in the past, we were operating more as middle school and upper school, and there was communication, but there wasn't really 
formal structure for making sure that coordination and communication were happening. And so now we are meeting in departments. And on Monday, actually, in the morning, all the departments met and did department-specific work. Um, Shannon is here. Shannon and Art Hall and I popped around to different departments. Our have upper school, school teachers, a department chair, a middle school, middle school teachers, and then lower school representatives. And then we meet as a curriculum committee, all of those people, and it includes Kelly Fear from the lower school, um, and Shannon, of course, and, uh, and we meet to discuss issues across the whole curriculum. So that is work that I'm, I'm really, really excited about. And I feel like it's already having a direct impact on the students. So I've heard some teachers say, well, yeah, I, when I was talking to my upper school colleague, we realized that we were doing the same thing, and now we're actually going to do a project together. Or now I've realized maybe I can let go of that particular area of content because I know that they're going to get it in ninth grade, and that's great because I've always wanted to go deeper into whatever this other topic is. So um, that's, that's wonderful. Um, there is a new committee or task force called the Feedback and Growth Task Force. So this is a committee of lower, middle, and upper school faculty. And what they are charged with doing under Shannon's leadership is designing an all-school teacher evaluation system that would go across all of the divisions. Um, this is in conjunction with the division principals, so Kelly and Art and I are, the committee is doing their work, but we're in kind of consultation because obviously we'll be charged with carrying out the evaluation system. So they also met on Monday and are, are really, really excited. Um, and they actually, I'm seeing Diane Foreman back there, our middle school learning specialist. I think they've, they're benefiting from her wisdom. She's implemented evaluation programs in previous school, uh, schools where she's worked. So um, this is great work. And I know this was something that came out of Vision 2020. So it's something that's been on the mind of, of parents and us as well. Uh, so in the realm of what's coming up in the next week or two, I hope that you will attend the winter concert on Friday. I hope that many of you attended the play a few weeks ago. It was so spectacular. I just loved it. Um, next week is National Computer Science Week, and it includes the Hour of Code. So there are Hour of Code activities going on in all three divisions. There are some upper school students going down to lower school. Um, in middle school, each grade is doing a different activity. So I think it's sixth grade is doing squishy circuits, where you can turn anything into a circuit, basically. Um, the eighth grade is doing a totally unplugged coding activity, which mm -hmm. Colin Angevine is designing. I don't know the ins and outs of it, but it sounds really, really cool. Um, and then we're going to have a special assembly for both middle and upper school with some really superb computer science experts who are going to talk about their process and their careers. So, we're really excited about that. Um, just a reminder to those of you who are 8th grade parents, the 8th to ninth grade parent gathering is next Monday. So please come out for that to get a taste of the upper school. Report cards are coming out on the 11th. They'll come out about mid-morning. Right, Shannon? Okay. Um, and then I wanted to tell you also that the middle school chorus is performing in Franklin Square at the Electrical Spectacle, the evening of the 12th. So if you live downtown or want to come downtown, I don't know if anyone's been to Franklin Square, but it's really, really beautiful um, with the lights up. And we're excited that the students are going to be performing there. So that's just a little taste of what's happening <laughs> next week. <laughs> it's a very busy time. Um, and just wanted to highlight again that the website, the new website has some great middle school stuff on it, including the clubs and service projects, if you're wondering what all the different offerings are. Of course, I had the picture of middle school students that's on the website, <laughs> Adiel and Hannah and being for worship. Um, and to remind you that another great window into the middle school is the middle school newspaper. Um, you can get to it at msnews.friendcentral.org. This is an um, article that I feel particularly moved by and I thought it was really wonderful. It's about the people in our community who work behind the scenes and sometimes go unnoticed. So it's about our custodial staff and our cafeteria staff. And um, it's by Mackay and Hugh, so I want to give them credit. But they wrote down things that we can do to help people around us feel more appreciated, including saying hello, looking them in the eye, telling them we appreciate them, thanking them for their service and making their job easier by cleaning up after ourselves. 
So if you ever see a middle school and you're thinking, oh, teenagers are so difficult and so self-absorbed and all those things, I mean, this is a really good example of the wonderful side of middle schoolers, too, that they are thinking about those things. And I think that's part of what makes our community really special. Can you put a link for this on the facts? Because yes. I didn't, I didn't even know how to get to that. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to. Um, so that's the just a little plug for the Phoenix Inquirer. There's also a ton of comics and photos and great material by students. So that's, that's all I have. So questions, Carrie. Um, so I love all the new initiatives and things we have going on in the middle school. It's fabulous. Um, sadly, I have an eighth grade son who will never take advantage of those things. He will be the one who's sitting at the table with his friends and not trying any of those things. So I was just wondering if you would talk to your faculty about ways to gently nudge or yes. be brag. <laughs> <laughs> attend one of those things or engage in one of the activities I've talked about. And yes, actually, we're professional nudgers and draggers <laughs> as middle school teachers. So we are always trying to pull students into different things and say, you know, I really think you would be great at this. Or I really think people would benefit from hearing your thoughts about this. So we're doing that all the time. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but we keep trying. Yeah. When are the clubs meeting? The clubs meet Fridays at 9.50. So during school. During school. So they all have to right. for clubs. They all are in clubs. Okay. Yes. And they get whatever club they want. And then we switch halfway through the year. Either they can stay in a club or we add different clubs based on student interest. So last year we added an anime manga club mid-year because students said we really, really want to do this. So this year we'll switch around the last week of January, which is the official mid-year point. It just kind of an observation as I see the students um, walking by is that, and for my own family, is the backpacks have gotten so much smaller. Yes, they have. <laughs> and thank, uh, I think that's a, an upside, mm -hmm. um, not something that will add to their academic um, yes. experience here, but it will help their back. <laughs> <laughs> and probably yours if you're ever having to yeah. carry your child's back. Yeah. Except for that guy. So service projects, it depends a little bit on what the project is. There are some projects that are designed to be full year service projects, like the yearbook. Obviously, you want the same group in the yearbook for the whole year. There are other ones where we ask students to make a full year commitment because of the relationships that they're going to make at different organizations. So for example, Carousel House, where our students walk with people who are visually impaired. We ask them to stay in that service for the whole year because we want them to form a lasting relationship with the people there. Um, that's true also of um, some of the preschools where it's better to have a consistent person with the, the little kids. Um, but most of the service projects, students can change every trimester. Interestingly, there are many students who want to stay in the same service project for years, not just trimesters. You know, like never want to leave a service project. So, other questions? Just positive feedback. I'm glad to see that you're addressing what's going on at Meaningful Worship. Mm -hmm. My daughter's giving feedback that she's not certain why she's there uh -huh. for that length of time. Yeah. <laughs> what's so interesting about Meaningful Worship is um, I'm an alum of the school too, so I'm saying this with my alum hat a bit on. Uh, middle school students do sometimes have a difficult time seeing how is this helpful or meaningful or relevant to me. Um, we do try to emphasize, I mean, how in all of our lives, how often do we really get the opportunity to be in silence and stillness? And what does that do for us? And that doesn't mean that middle school students uh, really fully understand that, but we do keep saying it and emphasizing it. And when you get upper school students, I think it starts to crystallize. And then when I talk to alums, um, I, there's a group of alums who are from my class that I see pretty regularly. We're still friends. Many of them say the thing that they miss the most is meeting for worship. And I'm talking about, uh, these are my husband's friends, so I'm talking about uh, men who, I mean, they didn't get it at all 
in the fifth and sixth grade, and I knew them then. Um, so some of it is developmental, and some of it is continuing to give the message. Some of it is continuing to tweak meaning for worship in a way that makes sense for middle school kids. And I've received some great feedback, by the way, from parents about that that I really, really appreciate that we're using as a religious life committee. Um, but I, I encourage you to attend meeting for worship, too, and to participate in it, and then please share your feedback then as well. You're always invited. You can sit in the back so that your children don't see you. <laughs> <laughs> um, meeting for worship happens Thursday is at 9.50. And I think a great value, in which I've seen in, in my high schooler, is that you know the, the ability or the kind of the skill of sitting in yes. silence and then listening, it it makes you become a more effective communicator. Yes. Because you're not talking to hear yourself talk. Yep. You're because you've learned through the process that people really want don't want to hear the joke or the joke, you know, the the, the non essential. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I've and I've talked to other parents about that too and I think it's a it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, the question was about math counts, which is a math competition. So, yeah, last year that was a club. Um, and then there wasn't as much interest in the fall, but it will probably be brought up again for the second round of clubs to see if students are interested. Um, so it's a little bit dependent on the, the numbers. Yeah, yeah, but we would be happy to do it. Chrissy Fitzpatrick ran it last year, and they really enjoyed it. The question was about clubs in the afternoon, and there has been some talk about that. I think the challenge is that middle school students have after school sports, they have after school religious obligations, um, they have after school, like outside of school sports teams. So the question is how to do it in a way, oh, can play practice? that wouldn't add more pressure or add one more thing, but be an opportunity. So Shannon is nodding her head. We are exploring that possibility. Yes. Any opportunities for students out to get them to speak up in front of the group or in class and different teachers do different things so um, I know some teachers do something that I did as a teacher which is if I knew that a couple of students were particularly reluctant participants I would actually give them a heads up at the beginning of class or even before and say hey we're going to be talking about this or I'm going to ask this question I would love to have you raise your hand, and just that extra time to think about it takes some of the anxiety out of popping up right away. So there, there are lots of teaching strategies that people use for that. But yeah, I mean, we want students' voices to be heard, and we want to empower them and have them feel confident. So um, it's certainly a challenge at this age, but again, we, we keep trying, and different things work for different kids. So. Um, my son went through Lord Smith here as well, and uh, one of his observations, which is probably no surprise to any of us, is that when you get to the middle school campus, kids aren't as nice as they were in the lower <laughs> campus. I'm just curious, what, if anything, can be done to improve that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think some of it is the tone that we set as a community and how we clearly, um, and at the very beginning, define expectations about what kind of a community this is and how we treat people. Does that eliminate students from being mean or unkind? No, but if we don't set the tone and kind of create the context and the feeling, then we're really you know, scrambling. So I think that's one thing. Um, I think a lot of the, um, the unkindness that we're talking about stems from two things. Um, one is students are trying to figure out who they are, and sometimes trying on different persona, a different persona or testing something out a little bit can come out in the form of not being as kind. Um, so that's one thing. How do we 
help students and navigate them figuring out their own identities, and that's, that's a challenge. The second thing is that friendships really change at this age. So friendships that have been long-standing friendships, all of a sudden something gets shaken up, um, and those friendships don't feel the same for kids, or they're, again, testing out different relationships, and so friendships can come under a lot of strain, and that's where we see um, students not being as nice to each other, too. So in the advisory system, we want advisors to be working with students and being observant of dynamics that are going on with different groups, and we try to prevent it, but really what we feel like we do well is we try to address it. Now, students are incredibly savvy about not saying or doing things when a teacher is watching um, or is incredibly aware. I'm sure they're like that with parents, too. Um, and so, again, some of it is creating a culture where there's um, support and an expectation that students will talk to advisors about difficulty that they're having so that then we can address it if we didn't see it. But yeah, that is, it's a huge, it's a huge challenge of middle school. The, the good news is that um, at this age, they are really still open to talking about things with teachers. And so, I mean, I summed in the high school and it's a very different story there. And um, I don't mean this high school, but just in general, that once you get past a certain age, it is harder to do that one-on-one -on -one teacher student work. And so we feel like we have the ability to do that. And I think also at Friend Central, one of our greatest assets is the relationship between students and their teachers. And so that is a really great foundation to start with. I also think that students are more um, have more empathy than we sometimes give them credit for. Sometimes there's a bravado or there's a facade about being a middle school student that it just takes a little, a little chipping away to get beneath it. Um, so as teachers, we know that that's the case. We know that we can get to it by doing good and ongoing work with students. Does that answer your question? Yes. That was a very long answer. <laughs> so I hope it answered. <laughs> yeah. I'd just like to reinforce that. I've had the same issue with my own son and some of his peers, both uh, French Central peers and uh, peers from you know other groups that he's a member of. And uh, I had the same concern. It just seems that it's something that happens to boys that age. Uh, and as soon as I was concerned about him doing that, I, I used to do that, and, and it really never goes away with your guys. <laughs> so I, I don't see it as something that's you know special here. It, it's just something that happens, and we all have to try to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, and the stakes are very different from yeah. lower to middle school, right? But, but when you're in lower school, some of the difficulties you have are about sharing, right? Or about the playground. And I'm not saying those things don't matter or aren't really um, upsetting for kids, but when you get to middle school and the stakes are your whole friend group, or if you're gonna be invited to a sleepover, or, or if you're going to be included in something that really matters to you, the stakes are just more, uh, I think they're greater, and they're a little more intense for, for many kids. So, Jay. I just want to say, I think it's also important that if you, if your child is struggling with that, to make sure the advisor knows. Yes. And, and certainly, we know a lot, but there are kids that are really good yes. at acting super happy. And, you know, if, if a parent calls and says, you know, they're really struggling, we can keep the extra set of eyes and make yeah. sure that we're doing at least what we can, and we can't solve all of it, but we can try. But I, th I think it's important that if you're struggling at home, we want to make sure. Yes. That we know. Yeah, thank you. That's a really important point. So I, I see the time. It's about 9.20, and I know people need to get off for their morning. I'm meeting with a prospective parent at 9.30, so that's exciting. Um, I just want to thank you for coming, and thank you for your great questions and feedback, and I hope you'll keep them coming. Um, and again, I hope you'll fill out the survey, and I feel that are attending Tech Tuesday at Kansas Channel. Where is Tech Tuesday next Tuesday? Next Tuesday, I think we're in the sun I'll we'll double check. I don't just the facts, but okay. I think next Tuesday night. It's okay. in the evening, so we're rotating mornings, evenings, both campuses to try to make it available to everyone. So next, this month is in the evening. Great. So thank you so much for coming. Travel safely today. Thank you. Thank you.